Our Bible passage tonight is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 to 58. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 to 58. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are heaven earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and the star differs from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable, It is sown in dishonour, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of earth, who are of the earth, and as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are, from, who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so we will bear the likeness of the man from heaven. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality. When the perishable have been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This is God's word. Well done, Beck. Uh, it's a long passage, and you know when you read it first up, you kind of almost get lost, don't you? It goes from the one to the other and back to the other, and you're thinking, what on earth is the apostle talking about? Um, and I think um, certainly the Corinthians were asking some interesting questions. Now, look, I do realize this evening that this is a long passage. Um, it could have been split into a number of different sections. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to try and get through it as a whole. Um, So if we go a little bit longer than normal, please just be patient with me. I'm trying to fit it into a a particular time frame, Um, and that's not an hour. I'm trying to fit it in with 40 minutes, but whether or not we get through that, we'll we'll see how we go. And I wanted just you to come away from here understanding what the Apostle is saying, but also encouraged. Because if you don't walk out of here singing hallelujah, then you need to burn me at the stake because I haven't done my job properly. Because it's such an incredibly encouraging passage. It just speaks of hope and 
what's going to come. So hopefully we'll walk out here singing God's praises. Let's pray and ask for help. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. It is a word that is so diverse in many senses and gives us so much insight into who you are and all that you have done. And so we pray this evening that you would help us to be able to understand it. We pray that as we try and work through some of the different parts of it, that you would help us not to get lost in the detail. And we pray that you would enable us to uh, have our hearts warmed and encouraged by your word. For Jesus' sake, amen. Um, it's always nice getting new things, isn't it? Can you remember when you upgraded your mobile and you went and got that new mobile out the box and you peeled away that wrapping and you opened the lid, whatever brand you've got, and it's shiny and it's new and you're taking off all the protective pieces and then you're putting on a protective screen if, of course, you want to preserve it. And you may be getting a case for it if you want to preserve it. I'm still amazed that people walk around without a case. And I say, aren't you worried about dropping your phone? And they say, no. I said, if that was my phone, it wouldn't last very long. And, and we use this brand new shiny thing. But the moment you open it, it starts getting old. And the moment you begin using it, it starts to deteriorate. And you get little marks or scratches. Now, you might have a protective screen that when you drop it, it smashes that screen and not the actual screen. I've had both and, and yet I've still broken a screen. I've still had to take a phone in and get a screen replaced in spite of a protective screen being on that screen. Because sometimes it doesn't always protect it. But the reality is in this world, everything gets old. And that was brought home with force to me as Scott mentioned in the morning service, if you were here, when I played golf on Friday with Scott, because I'd stupidly played squash the night before that I hadn't played for six months, and my body was aching, my legs were sore, my back was sore, my shoulder wasn't quite what it was normally. And so just bending down to pick a ball up was difficult, and to try and bend down with the legs was even worse because of the right leg is so sore from the squash. And it was a wonderful reminder. I turned to Scott and I said, you know, you're not going to believe what I'm preaching on on Sunday night. I'm preaching on the new body and I could do with an advanced, an advanced new body right now because it's, it's so sore. And the reality is, I know for some of you who are younger here, it's not really that real to you because you've still got a body that is functioning the way it's meant to function. For, but for some of us who have got a little bit older, certain things have begun to remind us of our age. Now, while in your mind you might think, you know, I'm still in my 20s, and when I speak to most older people, they will all say to me, I don't feel as though I'm 80, I feel as though I'm still 30, or whatever the case may be, in their mind. But the body says, no, you're not. And you feel these aches and pains that come on. And you feel that when you go back like I did to play a game of squash after six months, if I was 22, it, it I would, have, I would have even blinked. I would have got up the next morning and carried on. There would be no aches and pains. But not at my age. It just doesn't work like that. And the encouraging thing about all of this is not to depress you. Is Paul says, guess what? This body has to waste away. It has to decay. It has to die. Because the only way you're going to get a new body is for this body to die. So rather than become fearful and anxious and worried about getting older and certain things no longer working the way they are and maybe getting your teeth replaced or getting glasses or whatever the case may be, knee replacements, we should celebrate the fact that that is a sign that this body which is wasting away is beginning to shut down and bringing us one step closer to a brand new body. This is a spare body. If you're a Christian, this is your spare body. So if this body ends up crippled one day, if this body ends up with a mind that 
suffers from dementia, if this body ends up with aches and pains, and you're a Christian, take a deep breath, smile, and relax. It's not the body you're going to end up with in all eternity. It's a spare one. And so, (laughs) Christians should not be gripped by the fear of death. Christians should not be anxious about dying in this world. Neither should they fear getting disease or sick or ailments that, yes, are difficult to bear. I'm not trying to minimize that. It's not easy if you've got legs that don't work properly anymore. But rather than cause us to despair, it should reinforce the reality of what we are going to get one day, a brand new, eternal, imperishable body. And Paul is trying to help the Corinthians to grasp this because there's a problem. And the problem with the Corinthian church is that they have this, this, the sense of over-realized eschatology. Now, eschatology means the end times. And so what they believed is that when they had received the Holy Spirit and they had now had spiritual life, that that transformative process that had occurred had transported them into the new kingdom that God is preparing. So that the body they were living in, they believed, was completely irrelevant. It didn't matter anymore. And, and they were waiting for it to die so they could experience the fullness of that reality into which they had entered. And so, you see, that's why they began to abstain from things like sex, because they believed they were already living in heaven. It was just waiting for this old body to perish. And Paul wants to correct that understanding. He wants to help them to understand that not only is this body not, uh, re- uh, not unrelated to the next world, but this present body is the body in which we still live in the spirit, in this world, and the, that reality is not divorced from our everyday experience. It's not as though we're in heaven completely. That's yet to be. So he wants to, in a sense, bring them back to earth and help them to understand that they're getting ahead of themselves. So firstly, I want you to notice the effect of resurrection, verses 36 to 34. The effect of resurrection. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come into life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. And then he goes into a couple of illustrations, which I won't read for the sake of time. So, The illustrations there are there to help them to understand if you are going to enter into heaven one day, it means you have to discard this body in this world. And it means that you are going to get another body. It's not as if the the spiritual aspect of who you are kind of just like ether disappears up and, and there's some kind of spiritual apparition in heaven. But no, no, no. What God is doing and what God has already done is he's already made sure that when we die and when Christ returns, at that point, the new body that God has prepared is the new body you will receive. Now, in order to receive that new body, the logic follows. Like a seed you plant, and when that seed germinates and becomes into a plant, the plant doesn't look like the seed, but it's still related to that seed. And so he's saying that, yes, there's still a relationship to the old body, but it's going to look a little bit different. It's going to be a little bit different. And so he uses a number of of analogies. He talks about the sun, the moon, the stars, the animals, the fish in the sea. Now, all of that is simply to say 
that the kind of bodies that God has given those individual things are suitable for the environment in which they live. So if you take a fish, it's logical, if you take a fish and bring it onto land, it begins to gasp and it's just a matter of time before it dies. Or alternatively, if you want to go and swim underwater without any air and try and breathe in that water to think that you'll survive, you're going to end up drowning because your body's not designed to be able to breathe in water and continue. And that's all he's saying. When you get to heaven, if you were to get to heaven with this kind of a body, it's not fit for heaven. It can't be fit for heaven because it's fit for this earth. It's designed to live in this environment. And so God has designed a different body that is fit to live in the environment into which he will take you one day. And that body that he gives you will be an imperishable body. It will live forever. It will be free from decay. It will never suffer pain again. And so there is both to, for want of a better way of describing it, continuity and discontinuity between the body in this world and the body in the next world. There's discontinuity in the sense that this body is not going to be exactly the same. It's a spiritual body. That doesn't mean that being a spiritual body, it doesn't have form. It just means that it, we will experience the fullness of what it means to have a spiritual body. It will not be subject to the limitations of this world. It will, not be, it will be different to this body in the sense that you're not going to suffer joint pain. No one's going to have dementia in heaven. No one's going to lose an arm or leg. No one's going to end up scarred because they've done something silly. You're going to have a body that isn't subject to that kind of stuff in heaven. And you're going to have a body that doesn't begin to age. That doesn't begin to get old. You're going to have a body that is always fresh, if I can put it like that. Vigorous. One of the things of coming into a church as a pastor, you come in at different stages of life of people. And so when you see some of the older people, the plus 80s or in the 90s, I don't get to see what they were like when they were young. I only get to see them when they're older. Likewise, if you come to the church, you only get to see me at whatever age I'm at when you come. And that sometimes when you see older people who are sitting at home and they don't have the same energy they used to have, the skin has become thin, it cuts easily. Sometimes it's hard for them to do certain activities. You see them struggling to get up, and when they sit down, that can be difficult. Sometimes in, the sh in, in uh, just the normal daily activities, if they fall and they break something, sometimes it's the beginning of the end. But when you're 20, none of that's an issue, is it? And so... What Paul is saying to them is this old, decrepit body is going to be replaced. The body that's never going to look like those people who age and get to their 90s and struggle with certain conditions. But there's continuity. The continuity between this body and the other body is that there's a relationship that means there's not going to be such a, a difference that you're not going to recognize people in heaven. It's as if God takes the old body and he so fashions it and so makes it new and gives it substance so that you actually have flesh and bones because what Paul is going to now argue is he's going to argue that the new resurrected body is like the Lord's resurrected body. And when you think about the resurrected body of Jesus, what does he tell his disciples when he sees them after the resurrection and he passes through the door and he comes into the room and they're thinking, is this a ghost? Well, listen to the word. Luke 24, 39. Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones 
as you see, I have. So the continuity between this body, and Paul's going to emphasize this in the next set of verses, I'm almost getting ahead of myself, is that you're still going to have flesh and bones. You're still going to be recognizable. You're not going to be apparitions that just float around in eternity and bump into each other occasionally. But you're going to have form. You're going to have substance. You remember when Jesus is resurrected from the dead, when he's on the beach and he meets his disciples, what does he do? He prepares a barbecue for them. And they come out the boat and he says, come, let's eat together. And so they're still eating and drinking. Yes. Don't worry about that hamburger you think you might not get one day. I don't know if there are going to be hamburgers in heaven. But you're going to eat. You're going to drink. You're going to have form. You're going to have substance but you're never going to suffer decay, ever. You're never going to get old. You're never going to get the wrinkles you dread when you're young. I remember Janice when we first got married. I shouldn't say this. She's not sure I can say it. I remember when we first got married and she looked at me and she said, are you still going to love me when I've got wrinkles all over my face? Because she, her face at that point had nothing. The other day I said, I still love you. None of that. It will be a supernatural body. And the difference between, and he's going to emphasize this, the natural and the supernatural is the difference between Adam and Christ. So Adam is born as a natural body, not born, created as a natural body. And all who descend of him have the same shape and form as Adam. So we all have the similar kind of body to Adam. But Christ, who is raised from the dead, is supernatural. And so his body is no longer subject to the limitations that are this world impose upon us. And in the same way that Christ has a supernatural body, one day you're going to receive a supernatural body. It's going to transcend the natural body that you have in this world. It is a body that is going to be well-designed, suitable for the environment to come. So, yes. When I look at those in this world, and I have a friend, I have a number of friends who have have had issues or things happen to them, who lost his arm in a motorbike accident as a 36-year-old and has just got a stump of an arm and is on medication and will be for the rest of his life to mitigate the pain and the suffering that he has. Or when I think of another man in the first church I passed in Australia who wheeled himself into church and was a quadriplegic, paraplegic from here down. He only had use of his hands in that wheelchair, also a motorbike accident. One day he'll walk again. One day Jonathan will have a full arm again. One day my mother who suffered dementia in her latter days before she died, will have her mind restored. So, why do we get so fearful? Why do I get so fearful about what might happen to this body? It doesn't matter. Why do we live in fear about disease or And at the end of the day, it's just despair. Secondly, the body of the resurrection, verses 45 to 49. I am going quickly. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Now, what he means by that is Adam is born as, a, uh, born as created as a human being. Jesus gives life eternal. 
It's not that Adam doesn't have the ability along with Eve, but it's a co-ability to create life. But Jesus alone has the ability to give supernatural life. And in that way, he is different from us. The first man, Adam, became a living spirit. This last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural and the, after that the spiritual. The first man was of the dust, the second man from heaven. That's just in terms of their nature. One comes from the eternal realm of God and is eternal. The other one comes from the earth, created out of dust and belongs in this realm. Jesus comes from another realm in which he existed. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. In other words, our relationship is to Adam. We are from Adam. We come from him. All of us, ultimately, if you were to trace back your ancestry, and even Ancestry.com should be able to tell you this, they will tell you that ultimately all of us, without exception, have descended from Adam and Eve. As was the earthly man, so are those of the earth. As was the man from heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Those who have been converted and transformed by Christ have been given spiritual life, and they will be like Jesus one day with a transformed body. And just as we have been born in the likeness of the earthly man, listen, so we shall bear the likeness of the man from heaven. I declare to you, brothers, now I'm getting, uh, let me just stop there. As we have been born of the likeness of the earthly man, so we shall be like, bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Now, if that is not clear enough, then I don't know what is that reminds us that the body into which we will one day go is going to be a body like Jesus. Now, the question that then arises is, but Aren't we told at funerals to be absent is to be present with the Lord? So what happens there? I mean, when we die, don't we go into the presence of Jesus straight away? And yet here there seems to be an indication that it's at the parousia, as we will see, at the coming of Christ that all this happens. So How's this disjointedness? How come there's this separation? And the answer is that you who are who you are in your person, the intrinsic nature of your personality, which is not bound up by your physical presence, my person, who I am, is not, does not consist of this physical being. It consists of something that's intangible. Your personality, your temperament, the way you speak, the way you act, the people who get to know who you are and are able to say, Ian is X, Y, and Z. That person, that person who exists, in a sense, only in this body that enables that existence to be seen and experienced, that part of you goes directly into the presence of God at the moment of your death. And so while the physical body dies, the spirit, who you are as a person, is transported immediately into the presence of God. There is no delay. And that's why Paul says, in Philippians, when he says, I've got this dilemma, part of me wants to stay here, part of me wants to go, what shall I choose to be absent from the body, or to be present with the Lord, he says, I would rather be present with the Lord. And the only way you and I are going to experience the new body is through death, or the second coming of Christ. There's no other way. That's why I've said before, and I'm going to repeat myself, 
that the day of your death will be the best day of your life? Without question. Because the moment that breath expires, everything you've believed will become real. And you will be transported into the presence of God. Thirdly, the nature of the resurrection. I mean, it requires transformation. Look at verse 50 to 52. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. So Paul makes it clear that there is a point coming sometime in the future when we will be changed. Now, when he says we will not all sleep, I find that really interesting. That's another way of saying we're not all going to die. So there is a sense in which Paul is expecting the return of Christ in his own day. Now, naturally, Christ hasn't come, so Paul did die. But there was at least that sense of, maybe Christ will come in your time. We will not all sleep. There will be a generation in this world, I don't know when, there will be a generation that will experience God's coming. There will be people who won't die in this world. And in that moment when Jesus Christ returns, in the twinkling of an eye, they'll be changed. Now, whether this whole body just collapses, I don't know how that transition happens from this body into the new body that God has prepared. The Bible doesn't tell us. It simply tells us it will occur immediately. No delay. But it happens when Christ comes. So that's the timing. It occurs at the moment when Christ returns. Now, the reason that is important is because one of the fears of the Corinthians was this. They were reasoning, well, what happens if we die before Jesus comes and we miss out on the second coming? And Paul wants to say to them, no, 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 no. The dead shall rise first. In other words... You who are dead are not going to miss out on the second coming. You may not be alive at that point. You may have a body that's decayed in the grave. There may just be dust that remains from what you were in terms of your physical body. But nevertheless, in the same way that those who are alive are going to experience that coming of Christ, you will be raised at the same time immediately, and you too will experience the same coming of Christ. So that all of God's people, across all generations, across all time, at the same point in time, when Jesus Christ returns, will all be raised from the dead, and will all experience the coming of Christ along with those who are alive at the present time when he comes. Isn't that magnificent? Can you imagine that day? This mass of humanity suddenly appearing together, witnessing the descent of Jesus Christ. You won't miss out if you die first. It signals the end of death. Look at verses 53 to 57. It signals the end of death. For the perishable must, must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, when then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Now he mocks death. He taunts it. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Paul mocking death. This is Paul saying, death, you have no hold over us. This is Paul saying, yes, I understand the sting of death is the law, and the law is what gives 
uh, power to sin. And the reason that the sting of, of uh, death is sin is because it is sin that causes us to be cut off from God. It is sin that isolates us from God. It's sin that separates us from God. And since we are all born spiritually dead, we are all born separated from God, and thus we will bear the consequences of that separation if we don't trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul is saying, but you who have trusted in Christ, Jesus Christ has borne your sin. He has paid the penalty for your sin. He has died in your place. He has conquered the power of sin over life. He has delivered you from that sin. You are no longer bound to that sin. You are no longer subject to that sin. Death has no claim on you. You've been transported from death to life, and you are in Christ, and you will experience that life one day. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? There is none over the, uh, over the believer. It's only the unbeliever who needs to fear death. And when Paul writes here and he says, the sting of uh, death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, what he means by that is that the law that was designed to be something good became something bad, because what it did, it did two things. It defined what sin was. So now you knew exactly what was wrong and what was right. And so it kind of gave power to the law to make you either feel depressed about your sin because you're helpless and there's nothing you can do to stop yourself from sinning, or it resulted in pride because people began to say, well, I'm not as bad as that sinner. That's exactly what the Pharisees said. They said, well, we, we don't do some of the things that the others do. We, we're not that bad. And that leads to self-centered pride. And so you see, it's sin that, that gives power to the law to make us feel worse and worse or to involve in us a, a sense of achievement. So the law that was meant to be good ultimately ends up fueling sin. It gives power to sin. It puts us at one end of the scale. There are some people, Christians included, well, if, let me just limit it to Christians, who constantly feel guilty. Constantly. They kind of lurch from guilt to guilt to guilt to guilt. Because they never feel as though their Christian life is good enough. They feel as though they never meet the standard. And they allow themselves to get pressed down by that guilt, by that sin. Because they see their own inadequacies in maintaining a certain level of standard because they define sin according to certain ethical values. And when they don't meet those ethical norms and demands, they just become crushed. And they get depressed. I'll never be good enough. And in one sense, they're right. But Jesus was good enough. Jesus met the standard. Jesus never sinned. And instead of sin causing you to be crushed the whole time, it should point you to Jesus. And you should be able to say, when the devil comes and says you're not good enough, you should say, yes, you're right. That there is one who is good enough. And he is justified. He has met the standard I couldn't meet. So that sin doesn't depress us and disillusion us because we look to Christ as our justification. And then for the others, where sin might lead to pride, or, or rather the law might lead to pride, it's easy to look down our nose sometimes at other Christians and say, Look what they're doing. I'd never do that. You know, that person who got involved in an adulterous relationship wouldn't catch me doing that. That person who committed fraud, I wouldn't do that. That person who stole from the shop, I wouldn't do that. That person who mistreated their husband or wife, I wouldn't do that. And we begin to compare ourselves to others. And we always end up better than them, don't we? That leads to pride. And there's no place for pride because at the end of the day, were it not for the sacrifice of Jesus, 
None of us would have any hope. And if Jesus were to take the standard of the law and were to say, I'm only going to assess you on that standard, none of us would make it. We'd all fall short of the glory of God. And thus again, when we feel like that, we run to Christ and we remind ourselves that we are not better than others. We are just as bad as everyone else. But we have a saviour who is better than everyone, who justifies us. And then finally, it elicits a response. Look at verse 58. There's a whole sermon on verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So in other words, the response that the Apostle Paul says, now that you've got it, Corinthians, now that you understand all of this, our response is to say, we would not allow ourselves to be moved in our faith. Our faith will stay and remain strong because it is grounded in Jesus. And Jesus reminds us that we have been raised to life. Jesus reminds us that our faith is secure. Jesus guarantees us a place in heaven. Jesus has gone ahead to prepare a place for us. Jesus guarantees us a new body. And all of that then produces in us a response of thanksgiving that is finally worked out in the way in which we serve. Not only do we stand firm upon our faith, but our faith is always expressed, and it's expressed in the broadest way possible, because when he says your labor is not in vain, the labor he speaks about is anything associated with our Christian witness and anything associated with the gospel. In other words, it's the broadest way of looking at it. Everything we do is a labor of love to the Lord, and so we serve the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul and mind. We spend ourselves for the glory of God. And this is our expression of saying, thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. So our motivation for serving is never bound up with trying to impress others. It's never bound up with trying to look good. It's never bound up with trying to receive accolades. It's bound up in a love response to Jesus for all that he has done for us. That's why we serve. And that is a great privilege. And then he says to you, I think this is so encouraging, he says, your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. It may feel as though it's in vain at times. You may get disillusioned in your Christian faith sometimes because it seems as though you're not having a great impact upon others. You're not seeing people converted left, right, and center because of your witness. You're not seeing people come to faith and you're engaged in a ministry and it's hard, hard work and you give a sweat in, in this labor and you do it year after year after year after year. You get little thanks for the labor that you're rendering to the Lord and it doesn't seem as though a lot is being accomplished. But Jesus says to you, remember your labor is not in vain because everything God is desiring to accomplish through your faithful service is being accomplished in spite of you thinking it's not being accomplished. God accomplishes everything he sets out to accomplish. So in those moments of struggle and disillusionment, and we all have them, and as you get older, it, it, it's worse. I have to tell you, young people, it's worse. Because now you've got, for me, 37 years of looking back, of when I really started serving the Lord. And so you look at that 37 years and you think, what have I accomplished? How many lives have been changed through the service I've rendered to God? Oh, I've got no idea. You see your failures. Let me tell you, you look back over 37 years, you see failures. They st stick out and 
And the devil comes and says, see, remember what you did back then? But at the end of the day, you hand that over to Jesus and you say, Lord, you know, I don't know what has been accomplished. What I do know is that you have said to me that all the labor I've rendered for you has not been in vain. So you accomplish what you want to accomplish and that's up to you. And I'll rest in that. And I'll find comfort in that and I'll find peace in that and I'll find security in that. And it drives me away from ever boasting. Because at the end of the day, I accomplish nothing. It's God who accomplishes everything. And he will do what he will do. For his glory, not mine. That's our comfort. So can I encourage you, Christian, if you're sitting here this evening, young or old, young or older, your labor is not in vain. God has seen and God has been working. And one day, one day, when you receive that new body, when Jesus Christ returns and you're clothed with immortality, May you hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. What a wonderful encouragement it is to us. Resurrection. Whatever happens to us in this world, whatever occurs to our body in this world, Lord, help us never to become so disillusioned that we give up hope, but fill us with this hope of being raised from the dead one day when Jesus Christ appears receiving our new, immortal, imperishable, eternal body. May you help us never to lose sight of this. Help us never to allow ourselves to be so caught up in the difficulties we face and some of the dis disillusionments we encounter in this world that we want to walk away. Help us to persevere. Help us to trust in Christ. And help us to be faithful by your grace. For Jesus' sake.